Welcome back. We're going to start the first session now, section now, now rather, uh, on the very important or rather relevant topic considering our discussion that we just finished on the importance of basic sciences for sustainable development. We'll have four speakers and after they, are, they have finished their presentations, we'll have about 20 minutes for open questions and discussion uh, and your participation. So I'd like to start uh, with uh, my good friend, Carlos Perriero, who's vice president of Club of Rome. Most of you, I hope, were here last night for the very interesting uh, fireside chat, uh, which raised a number of provocative questions. And now Carlos has guaranteed he's going to give us all the answers, right? <laughs> And for full disclosure, I'm also a member of Club of Rome, so I can't be unbiased in this, right? <laughs> Carlos, please. I, I, I promise more provocations. I'm not sure I will give the answers, to be honest. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for, to all of you for being here. And thank you for the, to the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts for hosting us. And a big, big thanks to my dear friend Nebosha Neskovic, without whom this thing wouldn't take place. I mean, he has been working for a long period very hard to make it possible. I want to, as I said, I want to provoke you uh, around topics which have been already evoked in the introductory uh, session. And the first provocation, of course, is the title, learning what we already know. What does it mean? A few words about the Club of Rome. Maybe you have heard about it, maybe not. Maybe probably if you have heard about it, you have heard about the limits to growth. Uh, about the limits to growth, or I can use this if you prefer about the Limits to Growth report. The Club of Rome was founded in 1968, 54 years ago, by an extraordinary gentleman and a small group of his friends. The gentleman was Aurelio Pecce, uh, an Italian uh, person of the Renaissance in the 20th century. He was a businessman. He was, at a point, a freedom fighter against fascism. He was a humanist and a visionary who was all the time asking questions, and questions in particular about the future of humanity, and daring to approach those questions from a perspective which was quite unique, and is still, I think, quite unique, which is the idea of we have to see, to look at humanity uh, from a global perspective, we have to think in long term what happens long term, and we have to think in interdependencies, in what we could call ecosystemic, systemic, holistic perspective in which we realize that everything is connected with everything else. A very daring approach, because it's of course beyond the usual ways of thinking. And that led the Club of Rome, created in 1968, to define something we call the world problem problematic. How do we address the challenges of, of humanity? And now, nowadays, the Club of Rome continues its work. We made a substantial renewal four years ago in 2018 by, among other things, by electing two ladies co-presidents of the club, Mampela Rampele from South Africa and Sandrine Dixon de Clev from Belgium. And by organizing our work around five thematic areas that you see here, and uh, being, taking a much more proactive approach to collaborate with partners, with, uh, with our own members, the organizations of our members, but also with many other partners. And uh, what I will present to you is just an example of that framed in one of the, what we call impact hubs, the first one, which is called Emerging New Civilizations. It's a bet, the bet that the Club of Rome makes that what we are going forward, what where, where are we going? We're going forward in the direction of new ways of relating, of relating between humans, between humans and life at large and 
and with time, and that it is truly the emergence of new civilizations, in plural or in singular. That's a discussion, ongoing discussion. As I said, the Club of Rome was, uh, got uh, most of its reputation from the limits to growth, this famous report published in 50 years ago, exactly 50 years ago. And, and the report was asking a question when typically if I have to summarize the activity of the Club of Rome in one sentence and say, we ask, we try to ask better questions. That's all. Nothing more than that, nothing less. And better questions are questions which illuminate our blind spots, which inspire people. The question that this report was asking in 1972 was, does prosperity lead to collapse? Can the models of human development we had at the time and we continue having, can they lead us to the collapse of, of human civilizations? And unfortunately, I mean, we, people from MIT did an incredible job of developing a model, a global model, computerized at the time where computers almost didn't exist, um, model, a model to simulate multiple scenarios of the future. And unfortunately, many of those scenarios were showing that yes, uh, they might, the human, the model of human development we know might lead to collapse. This is the, the standard run or the business as usual scenario which shows uh, the possibility or the probability of collapse of human civilizations around uh, mid 21st century due to the combination of two factors, the use and exhaustion of non renewable resources by human societies and combined with the growing pollution uh, and both aspects are very much present today. So we might say that we have a big challenge that we can call sustainable development. And that challenge is, is a tall order. And part of my discussion is about what, what is the nature of the challenge. As a matter of fact, sustainable development, sorry to say, and this is a, pro a provocation, but it's based on facts, is an oxymoron. As you can see in this graph, the rectangle of sustainable development is empty. These are, the dots are countries uh, plotted against two, two factors, the human development index as defined by the UN, which involves uh, GDP per capita and levels of uh, health and education in every country. And the concept of ecological footprint measure numbers of earth, earth that we need to sustain our lifestyles, a concept developed by two of our colleagues in the Club of Rome, Mathis Wackernagel and, and Bill Rees. And you see that the rectangle of sustainable development is empty and the countries which are just on the border are, might not be those that you would think in terms of uh, balanced development. They are not the Nordic countries to say something. There are countries like uh, Cuba, Jamaica, Sri Lanka, the Philippines. And, and for the rest of the countries, there are no developed and developing countries, as our colleague Kate Rayworth says. All of them are, are very far. Almost all the countries are very far from this rectangle of sustainable development, either because the ecological footprint is way too high or because the level of human development as we measure it is way too low. Interestingly enough, it's not only now, now it's not only the Club of Rome who is saying this. I mean, we have been sort of, sometimes we have the feeling of preaching in, in the desert, you know, but uh, now, especially in recent years, um, Antonio Guterres is becoming, has become very radical. I heard him in 2017 uh, in Lisbon saying that, oh, but the only problems we have are collateral effects, climate change and the rise of inequality. I was shocked by the, the word collateral. How can you label those challenges are collateral? Well, he, he seems to have changed his mind, as you can see in this sentence, 
where it speaks about the war that we are waging on nature and that this is a suicide. And if you follow what he says lately, you will see that he's really uh, radical in his, in his statements. Uh, which I think is an interesting mind shift. In the Club of Rome now, we do several things. One of them is to try to define what kind of policies should policymakers follow. And this is the goal of, uh, of a project and a book which was just launched a few weeks ago called Earth for All, where a number of proposals of policies are structured around five areas, empowerment of women, regenerative agriculture, uh, fighting inequality, fighting poverty, and transitioning to renewable energies. But still with this question, you know, which is at the, the bottom, you know, why the decision makers don't do the, their job, and why the multilateral institutions don't do their job, or, I mean, the, the, the processes we have established to address these challenges, let's be honest, are not delivering the expected results. So why and what can we do about that? Just to be clear, uh, in spite of some reputation we have of being uh, pro uh, dooms doomsdayers, the approach of the Club of Rome is deeply humanistic and hence deeply optimistic. Or to use the words of a celebrated intellectual, in Italian intellectual, you know, against the intelligence, the pessimism of the intelligence, we, will, we use the optimism of the will. But there is an issue. There is an issue because how do we learn what we already know? I mean, and it's not only the Club of Rome which was raising the alarms, there were many others. It was in the culture of the 60s and 70s and even much before, that started much before, these questions about is our model of human development, does it make sense? Does it make sense that we associate so strongly well-being, or what it means, well-being and the concept of human development and human health with ever-growing uh, material uh, consumption? ever-growing material consumption without taking care of the consequences. So in May, we, together with my colleague and friend uh, Ugo Bardi, we co-edited this book, Limits and Beyond. We talked about it yesterday. And to me, it's, it's asking, this book is asking this question. How do we learn what we already know? It connects with something that is much less well known from the Club of Rome, which is extremely interesting because in 1979 we published a report. So connecting with, with what Michel Spiro said, yes, we believe in, uh, in curiosity, in the infinite curiosity. We believe in, in this idea that there are no limits to learning, there are no limits to our creativity. Even more critical situations than like the one we are today is, seems to be the precondition for the development of our creativity. So let's put that at work before it is too late, which was the title of the last book written by Aurelio Pecce in 1984, together with Daisaku Ikeda, a Japanese Buddhist uh, philosopher and poet. And they called for what they, they labeled as a human revolution 40 years ago revolution in mindsets, human revolution in our understanding of what is our place in the world and what should be the relationships between humans, between humans and life at large, between humans and time. So this connects with a revolution of consciousness, if you wish, but not only at an individual level, or mainly not at an individual level, but at a collective level. So, among the many things that we know, <clears throat> I want to make just a couple of observations about some of them. One thing we know, we know well, but we, we don't, we haven't learned. And I explain when I say learning 
How do we learn what we already know? What I'm meaning is learning, you don't, you haven't learned, you cannot say, we cannot say we have learned until we change. To me, learning doesn't happen if I don't change. So knowing is very nice, conscious understanding of something, but I comfortably leave knowing that and ignoring that for all practical purposes because I don't change. So something we know is that we don't have access to reality. Objectivity is a very tricky concept. We don't have access to reality. We receive a lot of perceptions through every square centimeter of our skin, through every piece of our body, we receive perceptions from reality and we interpret them according to a framework of interpretation which is most of the time unconscious. And based on that, we develop what we call knowledge. But of course, that framework of interpretation creates blind spots because we are used to look at reality with certain lenses, conscious or unconscious, explicit or not. The big, the big news or the good news is that we are, we are capable of being aware of it of being aware of uh, the, that we have blind spots. That makes a big difference. One thing we know, and this is a challenge to most of knowledge creation as it is performed, and most of science, is that complexity is not a problem, it's the foundation of life. We have been consistently ignoring that all actors in the biosphere have autonomy. Not only humans, of course humans, but all living beings, and even what we call inanimated things, have autonomy. Look at the autonomy of, of the atmosphere. Look, the, look at the mess where we are, because the atmosphere is actually autonomous. It is reacting, it is giving a feedback loop, a gigantic feedback loop, which is in a way saying, okay, these humans, uh, I mean, maybe we should get rid of them. So ignoring that radical autonomy of actors and, and thinking that we can control all, the, all of them and instead of considering them as interdependent be beings in constant coevolution with their environment, that's the epistemological shift that Hugo Bardi uh, was talking about yesterday. We have to learn this uh, once and for all because we already know it. It would be practical if we, if we learn it. And just a little bit of additional provocation about because this conference is about science, isn't it? We all love the idea that, that was expressed by, by Amal, Amal Khazri that science is necessary to make peace to make peace among ourselves and, and with nature and with life, you know? But let's be honest. Let's not cheat ourselves. Science has been mostly, and the development of science, yes, it comes from curiosity, from, human, from humanity. It comes from curiosity, but it has been used so often to wage the wars, the war between humans and the war, particularly the war with nature that Antonio Guterres was talking about. This is how the process of science and technology is framed. Even when we consider something which is softer, if you wish, which is the commercial applications of science and technology, making money, you know, instead of, of killing people and, and controlling people, it's about making money from people, by the way. So it's a different way of control. Yeah, maybe more civilized, but still a way of controlling. But in this process, do we believe that the process as it exists prevent the suicide that Guterres was talking about? Or does it contribute to it? And we have to take this exercise, you know, of questioning ourselves, questioning the role of science in society and not the tricky thing or the easy thing is to say, no, oh, but science is neutral. It depends only of the, the users of science that other people, so science is not to blame. Come on. 
Nothing is neutral. Nothing is neutral. Science is not neutral. It is always performed from a certain framework of interpretation, and if you dig a little bit, you will see that it's not neutral. It's more complex than that. So, meaning we have a responsibility, a deep responsibility. We'll have so my question, or the question we're asking in now is, is a human revolution emerging? And can, how can we help? And the news for you is that we started a few months ago a new program of activities in the Club of Rome called The Fifth Element. And the name is provocative, and the name is a tribute to life, but also a tribute to ancient wisdom, to the wisdom which identified four elements as essential for life, you know? earth, wind, uh, fire, and water. And built from there, built from a combination of uh, modern science and ancient wisdom, and try to find out what are the conditions for us to learn. Where is it happening? Where is the mindset shift happening? Could we sense what is emerging? And actually, the learning is happening everywhere and I will abuse a little bit of your time, but I'm, I'm, I'm in the final uh, uh, slides. Can we sense what is emerging from people often helpless and powerless, but fighting for their own ways towards a sustainable future? Can we respect all cultures and all threads of knowledge? Can we weave together ancient wisdom and modern science? That's the purpose, you know, we call this a learning alliance hosted by the Club of Rome to shift from a life, from an extractive model to a life supporting model. And my questions to you are these. My questions to the conference are these. You know? What is the role of science in times of collapse? Because this is where we are. What does it mean to be responsible? What social process should we have for science and technology? How do we reframe the agendas of the funding agencies? Because if that doesn't happen, nothing else will happen. Ma our invitation. We're really over now. Yeah, Somebody thank you. Else is tired. Yeah, yeah. Not my Finishing. <laughs> our invitation is, is this to bet on the humanity and capacity of everybody. <laughs> to bet on our strengths rather on a civilization based on controlling weaknesses. Shifting from colonial mindset to self-organization, from competition to collaboration, from splitting, splitting into boxes, different, multiple different boxes and disciplines into weaving, not unifying, but weaving together very different worldviews and disciplines. And you are all invited to this journey of the fifth element, all welcome. And let's try together to make 2023 the spark of a human revolution in science. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carlos. I think you've, you've very well provoked us with provocative questions, and now we have to read your book. <laughs> I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who you have already met, and we've already listened to her, speaking on behalf of UNESCO, Amal Kastri. Amal, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning again. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much, Carlos, for this uh, very interesting, actually, discussion and talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk again about uh, how to strengthen basic science. Can you hear me? Yeah, how to strengthen basic science uh, towards sustainable societies. And in this talk, I'm, I'm going to speak more about what we do in the section of um, uh, basic science research, innovation, and engineering, uh, which is part of the natural science sector at UNESCO. So I would like to start just by a little bit of history that you might all know that uh, the first time the, the expression sustainable development was used was in 1987 
uh, by uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who was the Prime Minister of Norway at that time, and she was uh, she actually presented this report, which uh, which was titled "Our Common Future," and maybe this was the first time that the environment was brought to the political agenda. Or let us say, uh, I'm not sure if it was really the first time, but maybe this was like the starting point of having environment on the political uh, agenda to be more recognized. Uh, sustainable development means that we need to target human needs. Simultaneously, we need to sustain natural systems. Together, together this might lead to providing natural resources uh, and ecosystem services that the world, uh, the world really needs. Uh, based on this concept, in 2015, uh, as you all know, uh, the all member states of the United Nations came together and declared their commitment to the famous 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals that you all know now, and that became really uh, a target for, for many scientific entities around the world. All universities, research centers now are trying to uh, develop activities to achieve these Sustainable Development Goals, despite the fact that uh, I think we all uh, might notice that many scientists actually don't know that their work uh, is actually contributing to the sustainable development goals. And this is the gap that we also need to work on and we need to uh, make the scientists understand how to uh, contribute to these goals in order to have the society, uh, environment and the economy together. At UNESCO, and uh, I would uh, like uh, to emphasize the S here because it is the only United Nations agency that has uh, the science in its title. Uh, we do all these five things together. Uh, it's a laboratory. UNESCO is a laboratory of ideas. Uh, it's, uh, it makes policy analysis and development of policies. Uh, it's a standard setter. It is a catalyst and the motor for international cooperation, and it is a capacity builder. This is we try to do all these things. Um, uh, at UNESCO. Uh, I mentioned in the morning uh, one of the tools that we use in order to achieve this is the uh, Category 2 centers. These are centers of excellence uh, from around the world who uh, uh, achieve certain criteria to be under the auspices of UNESCO. Currently in the field of basic science and engineering we have 25 centers, uh, 20 in the field of basic science and 5 in engineering. They are distributed as you see here around the world. Uh, we have 12 in the basic science, uh, in the biotechnology we have 5, uh, renewable energy 2, space technology 1, and in the field of engineering we have 5. The latest one that joined us last year was in Ghana. So we are really covering uh, almost uh, a big part of the world, let us say. Uh, another tool uh, uh, is actually, uh, before I move to the other tool, this is uh, uh, some analysis that was based on a survey that we ran uh, recently, actually this year, a couple of months ago, in order to see how these centers are, uh, are performing and how we can use them as effective tool to implement our, uh, our activities and our work plans. So this shows distribution of uh, the activities in all these centers and where they, they do this. For example, these centers make uh, funded uh, projects uh, sponsored by or conducted by the centers. This means the government, because actually these centers are directly uh, supported by the governments of the countries. Uh, these centers are focusing more on capacity building, so we, we use their, their experts to help us in, uh, in capacity building training, for example, and uh, boot camps. And for the outreach, these ones. So this survey helped us a lot in order to um, uh, make our work plans more effective. Uh, another important tool for us is the UNESCO chairs. Uh, currently, we have about 76 UNESCO chairs in all different kinds of basic science fields and engineering as well. Uh, some of them are very active. Uh, I would mention an example. Uh, we have, a, we have uh, a UNESCO chair in South Africa who, with whom now we are developing um, a nanotechnology program in Africa to help the African scientists to uh, study both uh, uh, nanotechnology and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have a very big program running uh, since many, many years in UNESCO, which is the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and the mathematics. Uh, in this program, we use, uh, use hands-on uh, training, hands-on methods, 
uh, we use innovative tools and we use uh, we train the teachers. Uh, some examples of this is the microscience kits. Maybe some of you heard about the microscience kits. This started really uh, many years ago at UNESCO. I like to call them uh, a lab in a box. So basically, we provide the countries who don't have the ability to build the big facilities with uh, small boxes that have uh, contains uh, small elements to help the students to learn uh, about basic science. For example, we have kits for biology, for physics, for, for uh, chemistry, uh, very small uh, tools. They can, uh, the, the teachers can learn and then they can in turn can learn, the, the can teach the students. Um, and actually, uh, we also now develop other methods in order to help them to produce these kits by themselves. So it is kind of sustainability. So it's not only that they have to purchase uh, the kits. So this is working very successful. And we developed this further within the past uh, five or six years uh, to another tool, which is the robotics and uh, the artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, in this one, the, the students actually uh, learn how to uh, this one, uh, learn how to make the codes uh, using a very uh, simple smartphones. Actually, doesn't have to be an expensive expensive one. They learn how to do several codes and then they, they learn to develop other applications based on this. And with the 3D printers that we also provide, we provide the kits and the 3D printers and then they can also produce different parts of these uh, robotics. Uh, so this is also working very successfully, and in the previous one, you can see, you can see these uh, countries that we ran this uh, program in. Currently, we did it in 25 different countries, and we are expanding actually more. Uh, so, and also in the sets, in the small island development states, uh, for example, in St. Lucia and in Grenada, we run this very, very successfully. Usually, uh, it's a five days workshop to train the teachers, and then we follow up on the teachers on how many students each teacher has, uh, has trained. Uh, so now I think we covered about 7,000 students, uh, 500 teachers and uh, 7,000 students. Uh, another thing we are focusing on, maybe I mentioned it in the morning, is uh, STEM in Africa. This report uh, was produced by uh, UNESCO, and uh, it shows clearly the statistics. It shows, shows clearly that 35% of STEM students in higher education are women. This is a very low percentage, and uh, UNESCO is paying uh, um, big attention for this in order to increase the, the percentage of women uh, in, um, in STEM. Uh, and when you go to different uh, fields like information, uh, communication technologies, it's only 3%. And really, this varies a lot from one uh, country to the other. So this is really very low percentage, and we definitely need to, uh, to work more on this. Uh, we have global science uh, programs that also help us to uh, implement our activities like uh, ICTP, the International Center uh, of Theoretical Physics and the World Academy of Science who offer a lot of uh, mentorships and fellowships for young investigators from around the world. This is working very successfully. We also have a grant program which is Green Chemistry for Life. Uh, this is a 30k uh, US dollar uh, grant for early career researchers below, below 40 years old. As are all these are working very successfully to support the scientists from around the world. Uh, we do science advocacy, of course, and uh, what we are in now is one of these. So we have uh, we had several international years before, like International Year of uh, Crystallography, Inter International Year of Chemistry, and of Light, and we also have international days, uh, like International Day of Light. Of Sorry, of mathematics, uh, of World Science Day, for example, which is coming soon in November. Uh, through these activities, we promote the importance, we, we try to raise the awareness of the importance of basic science around the world. And of course, the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development 2022 is one of these activities, which is very important for us. Um, UNESCO science reports, science reports are issued by UNESCO every uh, five years, and usually this is a uh, very important reference for us because we do a lot of analysis in these reports in order to see what's happening in, in the world, in the field of basic science. So are we, usually we raise the question, are we using science to build the future we want? And maybe Carlos can <laughs> answer this question. <laughs> so uh, so um, we have produced the six reports so far. The last one, we raised this uh, question or, or we actually, uh, these are the questions that were raised and we try to analyze. And the conclusion from this uh, last report that was produced in 2021 that the current development uh, model is not sustainable. 
this is a fact that we need to resolve. Uh, second, that the science-related biggest risks that threaten our world in the years to come are failure of climate mitigation and adaptation. The third is that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, further highlighted the critical need to prompt uh, universal access to science. And I spoke in the morning about open science, which, one, which would be one of the tools to do that. So the report showed these challenges uh, that we are trying to work on uh, on, repo uh, on uh, resol resolving them. So uh, I would like here to mention, uh, just coming from as a physicist <laughs> and coming from the field of material science, uh, this uh, I show this as an example. Uh, some of the statistics that showed up in this report in the latest latest uh, science report. Uh, this is uh, this shows the um, uh, production or number of publication in the field of uh, material science and engineering. And you see that China comes first and all these countries and then Romania here in the end uh, in between these countries. As you, you might notice here that there is no single African countries. Also, I know that coming from, I'm originally from Egypt and I know that there are a lot of activities going on in Africa. Still, it's not competing with all this. You see, there is a huge gap actually. And that's why for uh, Africa is a, pr uh, a priority for UNESCO that we try to conduct a lot of activities there. Also, there is an increase in the number, but still we need to work more on enhancing this and closing the gap. Um, and uh, the International Year of Open Science, uh, I'm sure it will help us to close some of the gaps or at least narrow the gap. And I would like to take the chance to uh, thank Michel very much for all his efforts actually that he is doing to, uh, to promote the basic sciences through this international year. Uh, we had the opening ceremony last July, as you heard uh, this morning from Michel, and we tried to put uh, the spotlight on the links between basic science and sustainable development. We brought a lot of policy makers, scientists together. We, uh, we had five ministers and uh, four Nobel laureates uh, we had a lot of uh, a collection of visual materials. Um, we had many, like three different panel discussions and exhibitions. It was, it was received very well. Uh, we initiated a lot of very important discussions, and we really hope to follow up on this for the year. And of course, this event here that we are in uh, today is one of these important activities that contributes to uh, to this. Um, okay, I'm sorry. This is a mistake. <laughs> Uh, I would like just to uh, draw your attention to one more thing here is the, one of the new initiatives that we do now, we are working now uh, within the frame of the International Year of Basic Science. Uh, maybe it's related to the statistics that I showed here earlier, that in Africa uh, you have uh, less number of publications in the field of material science. We are trying to help the scientists in Africa to be equipped with the facilities which are uh, very sophisticated and, uh, and very expensive and they cannot have like uh, the single crystal X-ray diffractometers. We are working with CNRS with the International Union of Crystallography and with Lorraine University. This initiative uh, hopefully will be implemented very soon. Uh, we are trying to give uh, remote access to the scientists in Africa. And actually, I, I would like to take the chance to ask all of you who have these facilities to contact us, to join us, to partner with us in order to be part of this uh, initiative. If you have this kind of facilities, uh, it will be great to we train some selective, uh, selected uh, scientists in Africa who they uh, actually go back and train the, the scientists back, back home and they can have the remote access to the available facilities so they can perform their work and own the data. This is the most important thing because before they used to send the samples, but in fact they don't own the data, which is a big problem. So now we are trying actually to resolve this and I would like to thank the International Union of Crystallography and the CNRS and Lorraine University for this uh, great initiative. Uh, yes, this is just, I have said that, that only few exist in Africa and that remote access uh, will be a great, great to provide an important characterization tool to scientists. Uh, so this is an example. I would like to uh, finish my presentation by just some historical photos uh, from the archive of UNESCO uh, because it shows how UNESCO since it started actually how the basic science was very important part of the activities of UNESCO. The first, uh, uh, the first uh, director general was actually a scientist. He was a zoologist, uh, and uh, this was in 1946 when the UNESCO uh, was established. And then the UNESCO Science Cooperation Offices. Uh, this, this shows a map of the cooperation offices. Uh, this, this photo is from 1952. Started really early. 
And uh, this photo I really like a lot. This is a UNESCO expert from the former Soviet Union instructing a class of spectral analysis in Afghanistan. So I really love this photo. This was 1964, and this was under the auspices of UNESCO. Uh, so also this is another one uh, where Niels Bohr, someone like Niels Bohr was, was there at UNESCO uh, together with the director, uh, Natural Science uh, Division. Um, and uh, yeah, so they were signing some protocols. And this is uh, for our dear friends from CERN here. UNESCO headquarters signature of the convention establishing the uh, uh, European Organization for Nuclear Research. This was in 19th of July, uh, 1953. And finally, this is the photo of Professor Abdus Salam who founded the uh, International Center of Theoretical Physics, which is still a category one center in Trieste in Italy. So all these great events uh, have happened. I'm, I'm proud to be now. Uh, I joined UNESCO like one and a half year ago, and I hope I, uh, we can contribute to more of these great activities in, in the near future with the help of all of you, of course. Uh, so this is uh, my, uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Amal. UNESCO deserves all the attention and support it can get. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Maria de Gracia Carvalho. Uh, I wish she were here instead of we're going to see her virtually. Um, it will be a video. Okay. Good. Uh, there she is. Uh, this is live. She's a member of the European Parliament for many years. Uh, she's at the Institute, the Superior Institute of Technology in Lisbon. She was a Minister of Science and Technology in Portugal uh, before she went to Brussels, where she worked for many years. She's also a Fellow of the World Academy, and we're very fortunate to have her here, even if it's from a distance. Maria, good morning. Uh, and her, she's going to speak on the role of research and technological development in energy transition, the European Union example. Maria, can you hear me? Good morning. I Good would morning. like to start to acknowledge and to thank the kind invitation to participate in enough. this very interesting conference. Uh, I regret that I cannot be with you in Serbia, but my uh, work in the European Parliament uh, um, has been very active nowadays in the field of energy. So I uh, ask for your um, understanding. Um, the topic of my uh, short presentation is the role of research, innovation and technological development in the European Union energy policies. Uh, we have since the 2006-2007 um, the, the first strategy on energy and climate change that had main three components, uh, the fight against climate change, the uh, competitiveness of the economy and the third component, the um, security of supply. We have to say and we have to confess that we have been pushing the two first two components, the, the, the fight against climate change, promoting renewables, also taking attention to the um, questions related with the competitiveness of our economy. However, the security of supply and the plans that were in the initial uh, strategy uh, that was approved in 2008, it was delivered by the Commission in 2007, but approved by the Council in 2008. There were many plans for the security of supply, namely on the gas uh, diversification of sources and the um, uh, ways of transit, countries of transit, that didn't happen. We, uh, Europe, um, along since 2008, become very dependent on one um, supplier, mainly on the gas, so we end up some months ago when the, the, the troubles between the war between uh, Russia and the uh, Ukrainian start, uh, we have imported 45% of the Russian gas. Uh, so we really need to, we need to rethink all this strategy and put more emphasis 
on the um, security of supply. So we are uh, at the moment, uh, since we have started this, uh, this uh, college with uh, President van der Leyen um, as president of the commission, um, again, uh, climate change and energy were the main topics, the, the, what is called the green transition together with the digital transition, but all the, the plans had to be in certain way re-evaluated since the war and the invasion of Ukraine uh, started in order to take attention to the security of supply. So the main uh, policy uh, that uh, the Commission has is called the Green Deal and the Green Deal is like uh, our uh, growth strategy that is based on the green transition. Um, this, the, this Green Deal uh, is a strategy, was not a directive, was not a law, but uh, after the Green Deal we had for the first time uh, what a law, uh, what is called a, a climate law. And this climate law uh, has as an um, uh, objective to have uh, Europe, uh, European Union, that um, reduce the emissions by at least 55 percent by 2030 and becomes neutral in uh, 2050. And I draw the attention that because we have this climate law for the first time, this is not a target, is not an objective, is, is um, something that member states have to accomplish because it's a directive, is a law. So there will be consequences if this is not, uh, these targets are not achieved. So th this makes all the difference uh, uh, compared with the previous strategies and uh, the, um, the, the, the previous work that we have been doing at European level on energy and climate change. So after the climate law, we had the need to look at the different sectors and to, do, uh, to develop di directives in the different, for the different sectors that match this ambition of the 55% reduction for 2030 and the climate neutrality for 2050. And there is a package, a very famous package, at least famous for the Europeans, that is the fifth for 55, exactly that has 17 new uh, proposals, some directives, some regulations, um, that the most uh, probably the better known are the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive, the revision of Energy Efficient Directive, but there are also directives for the aviation, for the maritime transports, for the cars. So in certain way we are looking at the different uh, uh, sectors of the economy and we have directives for, for uh, each of these. Um, sectors. For example, there is a, 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 an increased, a, a tremendous increase of ambition on the renewable energy directive. We are still, we voted this week at the plenary the proposal of the Parliament, and now we enter in negotiations with the Council. But the proposal of the Parliament is to increase the target for 2030, that was before 32 percent of renewables to 45 percent and I draw the attention that 2030 is very near in terms of uh, engineer and deployment of new projects. Uh, we don't have a lot of time in order to, uh, we need to, to work fast and uh, to achieve these, these targets. Again, there is an increased um, energy efficiency target and for the first time the energy efficiency target is a binding target. Before was an indicative target and now it's going to be a binding target, so uh, the member states will have to fulfill these targets. And uh, we, uh, um, in the European Parliament, we think that one very important component uh, to fulfill these targets is that we are equipped with 
appropriate technology, with technology that are affordable, that are uh, appropriate, that can deliver, uh, can help to deliver these targets. Uh, uh, we also believe that uh, some change of behavior is necessary, but we don't, we are not uh, apologizing a completely different uh, way of living uh, of the Europeans. We want to develop the technology that will allow the Europeans and the uh, uh, people in the world to continue to travel, to continue to be mobile, and but in using technologies that are less, that have less impact in the environment. So you see the importance uh, of research and innovation in all of this. And we have to tell you, and you know that uh, for most of these sectors, we still do not have the technology available. I was talking about aviation. We want to continue to be able to, to travel for different parts of the world, to travel inside Europe, that our students continue to enjoy the Erasmus, that go to study in different places in, the, in Europe and they can go back to their original place to see their families. So we need clean um, uh, aviation and clean aviation, we still do not have the full electric, uh, uh, large size electric uh, uh, planes we don't have yet a, a full-size uh, hydrogen plane, so we need to develop that. And our targets are very uh, close, so 2030 is extremely close to us, so we really need to invest massively in research and innovation in order to develop this new technology. And I'm giving the example of aviation, but this example goes to different uh, uh, different areas. In maritime is is the same. Even the long um, distance, the tracks, we really need to develop. We still do not have technology uh, to allow the electrification of, of these means of transport. Uh, the, the other sector that requires many research is uh, the, the sector of the energy intensive industry, steel, cement, ceramics, glass, we do not have the technology that will allow that these industry sectors will continue like we want that they continue in Europe, but the, the emissions um, from these um, sectors will, uh, will be compatible with the targets that we have set to ourselves. So, and it's not only applied research that is required, it's still a lot of fundamental uh, research that is required and scale up, pilot, pilot phase, uh, demonstration, but um, some of these technologies are not even yet at the pilot phase. So we are promoting a lot of research and innovation, a lot of research, even basic research, for example, in the areas of green hydrogen, how to produce hydrogen from renewables, how to improve, how to lower the costs, how to improve the scale, to, to increase the scale, uh, because we believe that the hydrogen is a, a electricity, uh, is a vehicle, energy vehicle, that can help because it will be easier to store than uh, electricity. So for that we have developed our um, research and innovation program that is Horizon Europe that has a strong focus on the energy and climate change. Uh, there is a, a uh, uh, is divided mainly in three parts. In the first part is what we call Pillar One, is mainly devoted to fundamental research with the Marie Curie grants, with the European Research Council uh, projects that are projects of large dimension uh, and that finance uh, uh, fundamental research. We have the second pillar mainly devoted to the collaborative more industrial, so more applied uh, research, where we have a set of uh, public-private partnerships 
covering most of these areas that are required for the green transition. We have, for example, the green aviation when we are pushing and trying to develop, the, putting the industry and the best minds, the best uh, university centers and research centers, put them together, uh, for example, to develop the plane that will for 2030, 2035, that have reduced emissions. So we are uh, in working on the electric plane and not on the hydrogen plane, but also in the new materials, light materials uh, for, for the aviation. We also are working on that. We have another partnership on, on hydrogen, clean hydrogen is called to, to develop all the technologies, the research and innovation and the technology that we require for aviation. For for hydrogen, we have another one in the in the rail. It's called Rail Europe to develop the new generation of rail, um, and um, we uh, are having some in the digital. Uh, in, uh, for example, development of microprocessors of ships that are so important. So, in certain way, are enabling uh, all these developments uh, in the in the energy. We also have one on the bio, uh, so the new generation of uh, biofuels, biomass is a bio-based uh, um, uh, public-private partnership that is also very important for this transition. Um, so, we are uh, convinced that investing in research and innovation, investing on um, the whole chain of innovation, having consortia that involves the key actors in industry together with university and research center is the way that we can accelerate the way to uh, achieve the targets without a drastic change in our way of life uh, in Europe. Uh, we are also uh, pushing for synergies with the national funds so that the national funds also joins the efforts together with the European funds uh, and they work uh, in the same direction in order to go faster, that we join the efforts to go faster because we really need to pull everything, the public, the private, and in the public, the European level, the national level, and the regional level, that we do all do a, an effort to achieve uh, uh, these targets. Of course, now um, with the, the, the um, invasion uh, of uh, Ukraine, we are forced to speed up our our efforts, uh, so it's not a, a reason to to stop. It's a reason to speed up, to go even faster. Because if we invest more in renewables, if we do this transition, we will be less and less dependent uh, uh, of the, the the Russian gas. But we know that we will need to use gas for for a transition period, a, a large transition period. So we are also improving the, the 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 use of gas, and we are diversifying the the, the suppliers of gas uh, from different uh, parts of the world. Um, it's very important that we. Uh, at the same time that we are developing all these new technologies and all the fundamental research that is the base of these technologies, we also prepare a generation of engineers, technicians for this green transition. And it's something that uh, we are very much pushing is for the uh, education and training and call the attention that the energy and the green transition is a very important uh, uh, area and an area with future and in order to attract more young people to study in these areas, including women. We have very few women uh, as engineers that work in the energy field. I myself, I'm a mechanical engineer working on energy and uh, climate change and sustainable development, but uh, I have the experience that uh, along my career, I had very few uh, stu female students. So uh, we need to make an effort to attract more women because otherwise we are neglecting 50% 
of the, the, the population, the potential population to study these fields. So all these are tasks that we really need to, to put forward in a very short time but uh, we are uh, very committed and uh, we have all the incentives to, to, to do it and I wish you, uh, this is the message that I want to pass and I wish you a very interesting conference and I just hope that uh, soon I can uh, be able to visit uh, Serbia and the region of that region of the world that uh, I know well and I had a lot of collaboration in my research uh, work during my career. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. And our last speaker for this session needs no introduction. Mabosha is going to speak to us about the new Tesla project, Research, Development and Education for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I will be talking about the new Tesla project, you have seen that, which is devoted to research, development and education for the fourth industrial revolution. In August 1989, long time ago, the government of Serbia made the decision on construction of the Tesla accelerator installation in the Vincha Institute of Nuclear Sciences in Belgrade as a large user facility for production, acceleration and use of iron beams in science, technology, medicine and education. The construction of Tesla began in December 1989, the same year. However, it was going on with frequent and long delays due to irregular and insufficient financing. However, a considerable part of Tesla was constructed. But in November 2007, the government of Serbia decided to hold the financing of construction of Tesla from the budget of Serbia and to continue it on the basis of clearing that of Russia to Serbia. By that time, the spending on the construction had reached about 15 million euros. But more than 75 of that amount went to the Serbian companies participating in the endeavor. That decision was a magnum crimen in Serbian science. Tesla has two parts, the low energy part and the high energy part. The low energy part named Pharma will be used for research and development in material science. These are the, the buildings of Tesla. Fama, the low energy part of Tesla, was commissioned in May 1998. It is currently in the phase of upgrading on the basis of the clearing debt of Russia to Serbia. When the job is completed, Fama will include a heavy iron source, I said the uh, heavy iron source, this is the M1 machine, the extraction voltage is between 10 and 20 kilovolts, a light iron source, this is the M2 machine with the extraction voltage of 10 to 30 kilovolts, a small cyclotron complex delivering protons of energies between 1 and 3 MeV and six experimental channels, C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5 and 6s. This is a part for modification of the materials and this is a part for analysis of materials. This is 
the heavy iron source within Pharma, the M1 machine. It was commissioned in May 1998. This is the small cyclotron complex delivering protons for analysis of materials in air and in vacuum, and it is currently under commissioning. The construction, as you may see, has been completed. The construction of the high energy part of Tesla, named the Vinci facility, was partly completed and it is currently in the phase of waiting for the government of Serbia to make the decision on the completion of the job. We are still waiting. The facility should comprise a medium-sized cyclotron delivering protons of energy between 30 and 75 MeV called Vinci and six experimental channels H1, H2, H3, H4A, H4B and H5. This is the magnetic structure of Vinci whose construction was halted in November 2007. Most of this was done in Serbian industry. The VC facility, the high energy part of Tesla, should be used for radiation research and development in biology, chemistry and physics, research and development in physics of thin crystals, neutron research and development with a small, inherently safe fission nuclear reactor. The fission power of the reactor would be only 5 kilowatts. It is a zero power reactor. Proton therapy of eye tumors, the yearly number of patients would be about 150 from Serbia and the other countries. And also research, development and experimental production of radio pharmaceuticals for diagnostics and therapy. The recent development and development programs of use of Tesla whose results were concrete contributions to development of the technologies driving the fourth industrial revolution are materials technologies, advanced modification of synthesis and analysis of materials, energy technology, investigations of energy storage materials, and analysis of geological samples containing rare earth, particle beam technology, development of very thin electrostatic and radio frequency lenses for specifically focusing, deflection, and acceleration of ion beams, and development of ion microbeams, nanobeams, and picobeams. Virtual reality technology, performing video experiments with ion beams and crystals, and artificial uh, intelligence technology, development of control and safety systems of the machines and experimental channels within the facility, that will provide the optimal achieving and maintaining of the chosen ion beams characteristics and analysis of the results of experiments with ion beams and crystals based on the recognition of the patterns prescribed by catastrophe theory. This is one of the results obtained with Pharma, the low energy part of Tesla. It is Ah, okay. This is, it is devoted to the hydrogen storing properties of magnesium hydride, hydride. Those properties were improved by implanting xenon ions. This is another result in connection with the program of use of Tesla. It is uh, the experiment of transmission of proton microbeams through a very thin Crystal of silicon performed at the University of Singapore in collaboration with the Vincha Institute. This type of analysis, called the rainbow analysis, would be fully introduced with the proton nanobeams with the Vinci facility. The programs of use of Tesla would be followed by the educational programs that would amend and enrich the edu educational programs in Serbia on the secondary vocational, undergraduate, postgraduate, and postdoctoral levels. Special attention would be paid to the re-establishing of education and training in the field of nuclear energy with the small nuclear reactor within the H4, H5 channel of 
da Vinci facility. Now the conclusions. The proposal of the Laboratory of Physics of the Vinci Institute is that the government of Serbia make the decision on the completion of construction of Tesla through the new Tesla project, development, research, development and education for the fourth industrial uh, revolution. But with the strong participation of companies from the group of, for accelerator technologies of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Serbia, the group exists. The decision should be based on a detailed consideration and recommendation of a special body, international body, consisting of supreme experts for construction and use of accelerators, appointed by the government. The completion of the endeavor would be a clear and strong contribution to the scientific and technological development of Serbia. This is a typical big science project in a small country. We were discussing this last night. The government of Serbia has invested into Tesla about 20 million euros so far. <coughs> The amount needed for the realization of the new Tesla project is about 42 million euros. And the time necessary for the completion is about 48 months. This should be done, this is our plan, in cooperation with the government of China, the European Commission, the government of Russia, and or the US government. These are the options one or the other. They can be combined too. In each of these cases, this is crucial, the complete Tesla should join the Central European Research Infrastructure Consortium, founded in 2014 by the European Commission. One of the next days we'll hear a presentation on CERIC on that consortium. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nabosha. Before I think of directing any questions to our panel, I would like to ask from the floor whether any of you have a pressing question you'd like to any ask any of the panelists. Maria, Maria, is ah, Maria is online now. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Very nice to see you again. Yeah, Sorry you couldn't be here with us. Yes, it's a pity that I, I would like to be with you, but uh, I'm attending online. So thank you for the Wonderful. invitation. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, please. Please introduce yourself. Yes, uh, I'm Federico Darimo, and I come from the United States. I have a question for each one of the panelists, but I will start my first question to Carla um, from in the UNESCO, you mentioned a number of projects that you have, um, the C2E, the training, the trainer. Um, in your map, you had uh, many countries, uh, but do you have collaborations with the US, uh, not in a sense having centers there, but using the work that is ongoing in the US, because there's a lot of work in, uh, related to the C2C, and in a sense collaborate. And for the trainer to trainer, the U.S. Fulbright program uh, sends a lot of U.S. Um, academic or PhD scientists or even students to other countries. And they do uh, certain countries. I'm from Greece. I'm a Fulbright or went to Greek to the U.S. So they have programs trainer to trainer. So have you thought of collaborating with the Fulbright program so the U.S. Uh, is, are sent to countries that you have programs? Thank you. you want to no, no, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, of course, uh, we are always happy to collaborate with uh, different partners. Uh, uh, we have uh, different partners all over the world, like uh, NGOs, uh, private sector, uh, governments, of course. Uh, in the U.S., we have um, we used to have one Category 2 center, which unfortunately not active at the moment, but we also have uh, some UNESCO chairs. For example, in the Penn State University, we have a chair, uh, Professor Awad Al Karim, who is actually in the field of nanotechnology, and uh, he is also joining us in some activities. So these are some resources we use. 
also at the moment uh, United States is not a member, it's not a member state of UNESCO, but uh, still uh, we, we, we collaborate with the, not directly through the government, but with the uh, private sector or the uh, NGOs in US. So definitely if there is a chance for uh, organizations who can support us, uh, we will be very glad to collaborate with, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Marcia. Hi, I am Maurizio Bona, a former CERN uh, staff member, and I would like to ask a question uh, to Carlos in particular, because uh, you said that the Club of Rome is uh, used to try to ask the best questions, and uh, there was... Better, not best. Okay, I better. Uh, I took note of what you said, which, uh, which is to me very interesting, because you said why are the decision makers failing to make uh, the right choices? And I would like to ask you the question, uh, has the scientific community, which is well represented here, done what uh, it can to help them taking the right decisions? For instance, by explaining the difference between collaboration and negotiation, which is the typical way countries meet and uh, discuss to take decisions? That's a very good question. And um, let's say that the, there is a big dissonance. We, in, the, in the fifth element project, one of the things we do is to make people meet coming from different backgrounds, so from business, government, uh, civil society, academia, activism, etc. But we make them meet as people, not as stakeholders, uh, not as representatives of pre-established positions. And in those conversations, you can perceive very clearly the dissonance between what people have to say in the usual official spaces and what they feel personally, and a significant degree of frustration because of that. So I think the frameworks, the institutionalized frameworks, are not serving the purpose of creating common good. You know, there is a big limitation at that level. So it's not that the, I mean, the scientific community coming to the first part of, the, of your uh, question, as did the scientific community go, uh, do a good job in explaining to policymakers? Um, overall, I would say yes. A lot has come from the scientific community. Look at the work of the IPCC over years. I mean, it could be better, of course, but this, this is not, the issue is not, again, in the understanding of the challenges. I think policy makers and decision makers understand very well the challenges, but they live in frameworks which prevent those challenges to be addressed particularly because there is this idea of we are representing stakes. You know? We are all stakeholders defending previously defined agendas of interest and getting engaged in negotiations and negotiations always look like win-lose games. You win, I lose, so I, my goal is to lose the least possible you know, or to win over you, etc. They are designed like that, and this, is, will, this will not deliver the, the responses. This will only continue the stuckness in which, in which we are. So again, it's a matter of mindset shift for the people sitting in those negotiation tables rather than a better understanding of the challenges. They know. Thank you. Uh, Albert, I just want to be sure we get at least one question for each of the, uh, uh, if that, if for Maria or for Nabosha? For, I thought so. Everybody. Uh, for everybody. Okay. For everybody. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Uh, Alberto Zucconi from the World Academy. Actually, uh, the human science uh, have uh, researched uh, quite a lot uh, and have been given a very important tool, not only to understand, uh, but also to promote uh, effective change. Starting uh, with uh, Wilhelm Reich, uh, that in the 30s wrote uh, a seminal work, uh, still valid today, Mass Psychology of Fascism, make, helping to understand uh, fascism, fascism from the right uh, and fascism from the left. And for that reason it was expelled from the Communist Party in Germany. Uh, also, we know that uh, for uh, sustainability, a barrier, a formidable barrier, is denial. People and uh, uh, also decision makers uh, often are in honest denial, meaning they deny, but I'm not aware that they're doing it. But uh, also, I wouldn't find personally mysterious uh, why politicians uh, do not do the obvious thing in the interest of the people. Very few politicians actually ever have done uh, anything, uh, not matter of sustainability. The politician, the first uh, you know, game uh, is uh, survival. So, is uh, for re election uh, in four years, uh, what uh, I, I know because uh, working for. Alberto, we're going to have a question here because yes. we so, don't have much what, time. That's, I, I want to be sure we get it. You're right, and I excuse myself. So, the question is. Uh, why don't uh, we use more what we know to promote effective, sustainable relationship uh, with ourselves, uh, with others, and the world uh, at any level and in every uh, societal endeavors? Thank you, Alberto. Uh, uh, if I could, if, if nobody's coming forward, Maria, I'd like to ask you a question that relates indirectly to what uh, Alberto has raised. Um, can you tell us in, any insights from the work of the commission? Obviously, multidisciplinarity is, is critical for dealing with these complex problems. But it seems to me the, uh, that Europe is doing a lot to try to bridge the gap not only between disciplines, but between basic research, applied research, policy making, uh, implementation that impacts on the human needs of the community. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and I just wondered if you have, can share any experiences, whether they're positive or negative, but what, you, what Europe is learning because this integration, it's not just, we need it not just across disciplines, we need it across each stage if we're to accelerate implementation. And Europe's very serious about getting real change. Uh, so is there anything you can share to us from the, your experience? Thank you very much, very important question. Um, uh, first, on our, uh, there is a question of the policies and the question of the funds. So European uh, Commission has a lot of funds for research. I was rapporteur of Horizon 2020 and the rapporteur of uh, a great part of the instruments of Horizon Europe. And what we what we try to, to achieve in, inside the, the research and innovation funds is that we have we cover the whole chain from very fundamental research to uh, te uh, technological development, to innovation, to implementation, uh, like innovative demonstration. And we try to avoid that there are gaps, that there are interlinks between the fundamental research 
and the, the, the applied research and the technological development. It's not easy because there is a tendency to, to work in silos, but on the fund we try to mix them um, and that they work together in a circles way and not in a linear way. So, for example, again, like I gave in the, the example of, uh, of aviation, we tried that the, the fundamental uh, researchers on fluid flow or uh, work or aerodynamics work together with the ones that are designing the, the new generation of airplanes. Um, the second point that I want to, to mention is about the policy making. We have a system inside in the European Union, inside the European Commission, that is very much based on independent science advice. So there is uh, many groups of experts advising the Commission, but there is a, a group that is the scientific uh, chief uh, scientific advisors that are advising at the topest level, at the, the uh, president of the Commission level, and they are completely independent and they advise on question on the complex question. They cannot advise on er everything, but on the uh, very complex that need a science-based uh, they, they advice, such as uh, climate change, uh, OGM, so all the difficult issues, uh, they do opinions that uh, are on the base on the policy making. And the second topic that is very important, we also have an, um, an independent group of ethics, uh, is the European Group of Ethics on Science and New Technology that gives the advice on the ethics dimension. So on complex issues, the, uh, apart from the, 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 the information that the college, the College of Commissioners have from the service, from the normal scientific uh, um, groups, they have, if they require, they have the opinion of the science uh, chief scientific advisors and uh, an opinion on the ethics implications. And for example, this the question that we're saying why we don't do more for the next generation is something that, for uh, example, the ethics group is always pushing that we have a, an ethical approach to sustainability. So uh, it's one of the best architectural that. Uh, uh, I know in, in global governance and uh, uh, I think that uh, is working. We are seeing the, 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 the very important decisions on, on climate, uh, on energy that the Commission is doing. Uh, very pragmatic because we know that is not difficult, that is very difficult, that we have to be uh, pay attention to the transition, that we cannot destroy jobs from one moment to the other. We need to, to also to create new jobs, so it's, it's very difficult decisions, but it's based on science and ethics, uh, sound ethics um, advice. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. There's, I would like to ask if there's a question for Nabosha. Yes, please. So, uh, I was wondering, I so much. Just, just a moment for the mic. TNRI from Arizona State University. So this example of Tesla uh, facility is in a perfect example of interdisciplinary science. We are all talking about uh, the uh, also the basic science connected to the applied science with so society relevance of nuclear isotopes that could be uh, very much used. So it has all the elements of perfect thing that we are all talking about. U.S. have done uh, 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 developed user facilities that are being used for such a uh, uh, thing. Is uh, UNESCO thinking about uh, making such facilities like these, uh, user facilities where people can study the materials, have the apl applications? Uh, what do you think uh, is the current trends? Well, the concept, uh, as I have said, this is a typical big science project in a small country, but it has been designed uh, as a big science in a, a big science project in a big country. This, this is the same. 
the content is wide and rich, as you know, and includes, let me say, the whole chain of research and development. It also includes production, because in order to make it, you engage companies from your country to learn technologies and then to use those technologies on the world market. This is, a, this is the, the, the first institution uh, that has uh, invented that and applies it to CERN. It is the largest laboratory in the world and there are others similar, but CERN is uh, the leader in that. And we started our project in close collaboration with CERN in the beginning of the 90s. But the political situation in this country was changing in a long period of time. 30 years passed. Today, we are, I have to say, at the end, yes or no. The government should make a decision. Everything is clear. All international uh, uh, verification was positive. But the question is why this government, the government, not this particular government, the previous government has have not done that. It's a facility that can give so much. So why is it only, are you finding the solutions only in Serbia or it could be broader than that? Uh, let me just add, and then Michelle may ask. We uh, does not have to forget the international component of that, and if you will, uh, the geopolitical component. We are aware of the fact that the Western countries do not support this project. Full stop. We are aware of that. In line with what you said, uh, and with this question, why don't you collaborate with the neighboring countries in a model which is like Sesame, which could be uh, something which could be very, which would be very well received? Okay, the answer is very simple. We created in 1996 the Tesla uh, uh, Research Center. It comprised 12 institutions from Bratislava to Bologna a huge collaboration. All those institutions and country were supporting the project 100%. This is one thing. On the other thing, in 2016, the World Academy of Art and Science launched the SACE project, thinking that the Tesla should be the core of that project. But after a few years, it, that collaboration was stopped. And let me be very frank, because of the pressure from a Western country, the project was stopped. Tesla was kicked out. That's the end. That's why I say it's political and geopolitical also. But my opinion is that this government, this country, not this government, a number of governments uh, have been involved in this. This country should fight, fight for that and win and complete this. That would provide fantastic regional collaboration. Fantastic. We had that experience. We, we have tried that, believe not tried, we were successful in that in a long period of time. We're going to run out of time now, and uh, we never got, gave an answer to Alberto for his question. Uh, can you do it in one minute? Yes, I can. Thank you for the opportunity to make a fundamental point. In our view, in the view of the fifth element, the question is not how do we work to convince people? The question is different from that. That question of how do we convince them, whether policymakers or people in general, is built on the hypothesis that people are problematic, that they don't understand, that they vote for Trump, whatever, that people are problematic. And we have to convince them, not to say to manipulate them, you know, people dream, some people dream with the idea of Cambridge Analytica for good. In my view, this is a big mistake of understanding. Our bet, and it's a bet, it's in an exploration, is that we have to bet on the humanity of and capacity of everybody. So the question is not how do we convince people to do something that they are not doing by themselves. It's how do we create the conditions 
for people to learn and act by themselves, betting on their humanity. And can it happen? Yes, it can. And this is what we are learning from people on the ground, from situations on the ground, in schools, in the townships in South Africa, in uh, poor communities in, in Tangier, all over the world in the constellation and network, that the, the possibility of emergence exists. But it's a possibility of creating the conditions for people to get out of their, their helplessness and learn and act by themselves, not of convincing them of the contrary they, they have been thinking. Very different approach. Thank you. And a, a very important topic for all of us to be thinking about as to how we bring about the changes that we know need to be brought about. That's really an underlying theme of this whole conference. We've completed, we've run out of time for this session. I know there are many other questions and many issues. Many more, many more questions have been raised than we have a time to answer. But we have, this is just the first morning of the conference, so we look forward to many more opportunities. I'd like to thank the four speakers for stimulating us, provoking our thought, uh, and sharing their experiences with us.